Hey everyone and welcome to your Linux and open source news fix for May 2021. This time we have tons of new hardware running Linux out of the box, Valve is rumored to launch a Linux powered Nintendo Switch like device, there's the end of the Glimpse project and plenty of other updates. Let's dig in right after this. This video is sponsored by Tuxcare. And if that sounds familiar, it's because Tuxcare is the new brand regrouping kernel care and their extended lifecycle support services. So with Tuxcare, you now get three main services. The first one is live patching. So your Linux kernel, your libraries, your databases, your virtualizations, your IoT devices can all receive automated security patches that don't need downtime to be applied. They are all patched live. Now the second services is providing an extension to the lifecycle of the Linux kernel, which means that you can use a specific version of the kernel for longer and still be up to date in terms of security, even on an end of life distro. And third, they also offer support services which are reasonably priced and flexible because they are vendor independent. As a whole, Tuxcare is now an integrated brand of services to automate and improve your Linux operations so you get more flexibility in choosing the distro you want to run on your servers, when to upgrade it, and you can reduce your maintenance cost without sacrificing security. I left a link in the description below so you can check all the Tuxcare services and get a free proof of concept for your organization. Okay, let's begin with the Linux news. Google has announced that their integration with Linux will deepen with the release of Chrome OS 90. As of now, Chrome OS could run Linux apps through what they call the Linux Developer Environment or LDE, but that was still in beta. With Chrome 91, that's now a default feature. The LDE allows Chrome OS users to run standard Linux applications like LibreOffice or the GIMP natively on the device complete with GPU acceleration, access to the USB drive, and basically all system features. I'm not a Chrome OS user, because my needs aren't covered at all by that OS, including my privacy needs, but it's nice to see that more users will be exposed to open source Linux applications. Chrome OS has been fairly successful after all, so if it can end up bringing more people to the open source side of things, and maybe give them a taste of a Linux desktop in general, that's all good in my book. Now this app support won't be enabled out of the box, so I don't know how many people will in fact use it. It seems like someone received a DMCA notice after downloading an ISO of Ubuntu through BitTorrent. These notices are warnings that Americans receive from their internet access provider to inform them that their internet access has been used to download something that is in breach of copyright law. So of course, an Ubuntu ISO shouldn't cause this kind of notice to be sent. These are free to download and free to share. It could have been an error from the monitoring system, or it could have been a fake notice as well. But if that's not the case, there are some weird implications here. These notices can lead to termination of your internet access, so if the company is registering what is protected by copyright suddenly decide that certain files aren't to be shared, they could claim that you're infringing on intellectual property by downloading them and thus shut your access down. That's a lot of power to give to a private company in my opinion. And moving on to the open source news and Google finally launched Fuchsia. How that thing is supposed to be pronounced? It's their long announced open source operating system that they have repeatedly billed as not a replacement for Android. It's a very stealthy release without bombastic announcements and it's only coming to one specific device, the Google Home Hub, also known as the Nest Hub. The release of that OS doesn't change any features or the user interface, it's probably just a background switcheroo thing just to prove that the OS can work in a normal customer environment. Fuchsia isn't based on Linux, it uses its own kernel entirely called Zircon and Google seems to be pushing it towards more connected home devices for now. But who knows where it might lead in the future if it's successful and efficient. It might be used in the end as a replacement for Android. Have I been pawned? The tool that lets you know if one of your online accounts is part of a data leak is now open source. Now this great tool had been on the verge of being sold to a company a while back, but it was then maintained as independent and its code is now accessible for everyone to see, use and contribute to. The tool is also teaming up with the FBI to share compromised passwords databases, so Have I Been Pawned will be even more thorough in letting you know if your credentials are exposed or not. 
The use cases are pretty simple. Online services could make use of it to see if the password you're trying to use to create your account is compromised, or they could just use that database to let you know if that password has just been leaked somewhere so you can change it immediately. It's really cool to see such a useful tool being opened up like this. Now onto the gaming news. Days Gone is now working on Linux through Proton Experimental. For those who don't know, Days Gone was a PlayStation exclusive game, but as with Horizon Zero Dawn, Sony seems to be tentatively testing the waters and brought it to Steam. Well, thanks to the great work of Valve and Collabora, we now have it working on Linux through the latest Proton Experimental release. The Mass Effect Legendary Edition also now works using the latest release of Proton GE, so you can be Commander Shepard on Linux as well. For those who don't know, Proton GE is a custom distribution of Proton that you can place in the compatibilitytools.d folder inside your Steam installation, and you can use that for any game you'd like. It generally adds tweaks and performance improvements for specific games, and generally has support for games pretty quickly. It's really cool to see these games being supported a few days after their release, running with near-native performance. It's an awesome time to be a Linux gamer. And it seems like it's going to be an even more awesome time soon, because Valve seems to be wanting in on the craze around Nintendo Switch-like devices, and they're apparently working on something codenamed the Steam Pal. It's all speculation for now, driven by bits of text found in some of Valve's code, but if we recap what most people think will happen, it should be something in the form factor of a portable gaming console, probably akin to the Switch, likely using either Intel or AMD chips, although I'd bet on AMD for a bit more graphics power, and it should be running Linux, because licensing Windows for each device would probably drive the cost way up, and also because gaming on Linux is now eminently viable through Proton and super easy to set up. It probably also will have Steam Link baked in, so other, more demanding games can run on a more powerful desktop and be streamed to the portable console. I'm excited to see what Valve could bring to the market, and the boost it could give to Linux gaming development in general, but we'll have to see if that thing does materialize and what it will effectively be. Now moving on to the hardware news, and there is a lot to unpack here, no pun intended. Tuxedo announced their new Infinity Book Pro 14, a rare beast in the Linux laptop world as it comes with a 3K screen with a resolution of 2880x1800, which is a 16x10 ratio, way better for productivity than the usual 16x9. The base model starts at 1249 euros, and that will net you an 11th gen quad core i5, but the display will only be 1920x1200. You also get 8GB of RAM and 250GB of SSD. The 3K screen is only a 50 euros upgrade, which is a complete no-brainer, and the rest of the device can be spec'd up as well, up to 64GB of RAM and 4TB of storage. The I.O. seems plentiful with Thunderbolt 4 support, and the case is made of a magnesium alloy. It definitely looks like a great premium ultrabook that I probably will review in the future. Entroware, a UK-based Linux computer manufacturer, announced their Proteus laptop. It has a 1080p display, an 11th gen core i5 with 8GB of RAM, 250GB of SSD, as well as Intel XE graphics. It also supports Thunderbolt 4, and now it might sound super similar to the previously mentioned Infinity Book Pro 14 from Tuxedo, but it doesn't use the same chassis. It begins at £820, which should amount to €950, Euros, or around $1,000. The chassis here is made out of aluminium, and the device weighs around 1.7 kilograms, which isn't too heavy for a 15-inch device. It also embarks a 75-watt-hour battery, which should offer it a very nice battery life. Slimbook has a new version of its Slimbook 1, a super small form factor desktop that still packs a good amount of power. It comes with a Ryzen 7 4800H, which is a really powerful chip with good graphics capabilities, and its port selection is good, with a full HDMI port, a USB-C, two USB-2 and two USB-3, an Ethernet jack, a Mac input, and an audio jack out on the back, plus two more USB ports on the front, although these are only USB-2, unfortunately. It starts at 600 euros, taxes included, and that will give you 8 gigabytes of RAM and 250 gigabytes of SSD. You can spec the little thing up to 64 gigabytes of RAM and 4 terabytes of storage, and pick whatever distro you want to run on that powerful little PC. If you've been looking for a Mac Mini equivalent in the Linux world, it's a very good bet. I'll see if I can get one to review on the channel. 
And as with all news videos, yet more JankPad A1 news, with a new video showing a hands-on with the tablet, which seems to have made strides in the software department. The previous video showed a glimpse of Jing OS, the Linux distro tailored for tablets, but it didn't seem to behave correctly on that tablet. But on this video you get a feeling of snappiness, everything looked quite fast and responsive, and although they only showed changing the wallpaper and using the calculator, it seemed to be able to switch between apps with just a few swipes. It all seemed pretty nicely animated and fluid. They also released an update to Jing OS, which adds support for more resolution, more complex passwords, Gaussian blur on transparent interface elements, and the ability to decompress files in the file manager, among other things. Of course, these are all pretty basic features, and I'm sure that if that tablet sees the light of day, the software is going to have some catching up to do. But it's nice to see some progress being shared. And let's complete this video with the application news. First, 1Password now has an official Linux app out and available since it's out of beta. While it's made with Rust and Electron, it still has great integration with your system, supporting system-wide dark mode preferences, it has integration with GNOME and KDE, a system tray icon, the ability to fill in in your default browser, and integration with the X.0 clipboard, support for the keyrings in GNOME and KDE, and a lot more. And moreover, the Linux app has received features that aren't yet available on the other clients of 1Password, like secure file attachments and item archiving and deletion. Now the only issue is that 1Password only provides a .deb package, so users of distros that aren't Debian or Ubuntu based are out of luck. There's also a snap package, but that doesn't integrate as well with the system. Despite this, it's cool to see a developer supporting Linux well, integrating with our APIs and system hooks, and even making some features available on our systems first. 1Password is a paid-for application at $3 a month. Inkscape got a new release, version 1.1, with a lot of new features to help users better take advantage of the power of this open-source vector drawing app. There's a new welcome screen when you start the application that lets you pick what kind of file you're going to work on, the size of the canvas, its background color, and a lot more. And this should make starting with a new file a lot easier. Inkscape also got a new command palette, which is basically a search bar for all options, tools, plugins, and commands. Hitting the question mark key will bring a search bar up, and you'll be able to type whatever you're looking for and activate that command a lot more easily than with hunting through the menu bar. Exporting your files to the PNG format should also be more straightforward, with fewer clicks needed. I left a link to the release video in the description, check it out if you want to learn more. Glimpse, the fork of GIMP with a non-connoted name, is on pause and won't receive further updates for now. That fork has appeared after people started questioning GIMP as a name, seeing that it's an offensive and dismissive word in some languages. Glimpse had mainly just removed old GIMP branding and added their own, which I kinda liked. They were working on an interface rewrite called Glimpse NX, but this used up most of the contributor's time, and the project itself lacked non-coding contributions to provide support, write documentation, answer questions. This all meant that the project leader had to do a lot of this himself instead of writing code. In short, it didn't seem sustainable to keep working at it. I used Glimpse instead of GIMP, personally, but I won't have any trouble returning to GIMP now, since the projects never really diverge in terms of look and feel or features. We'll see if the main GIMP project will take notice of the efforts that went into rebranding Glimpse, and maybe try to be more open to discussion on that matter. And finally, OnlyOffice, the open source Office suite, has a new release out, version 6.3. It brings a long-awaited dark theme, with a slightly revamped light theme as well, but you can keep using the previous look if you prefer. It can also support 150% scaling if your system is set up to use that. Previously, it was either 1x or 2x. They also say that 125% and 175% support is coming soon. This new version also allows you to password protect files and to save the change tracking to the file itself, so people opening it in another office suite should be able to have that change history as well. Version 6.3 also brings easier access to the list style you want to use, new charts in the spreadsheet, faster spell checking, and the ability to open XML files and to save to EPUB or HTML. This new version isn't yet available through Flatpak it seems, but it should come soon. 
And that concludes it for this video guys, I hope you enjoyed, if you did don't hesitate to like or dislike if you didn't, you can also subscribe and turn on notifications to get more videos like this one, and you can also watch these videos on Odyssey if you don't really like YouTube. If you want to help support the channel, you can join my Patreon subscribers and my YouTube members. Whatever your subscription tier, you'll get access to my weekly Patreon cast and the right to vote on the next topics I cover. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!